Good morning, everyone. So I am here to talk to you today about loneliness and social isolation. Before, during, and it says after COVID, but COVID is still with us, so I think it's just before and during COVID. Um, my name is Tracy Schrepfer, and I'm a professor in the School of Social Work. Um, my areas of expertise are aging, and in particular, working with people who are dying. I've worked in the field of aging for over 30 years. Um, and certainly loneliness and social isolation, uh, I have talked about a lot during that times and lectured on, but I think it is even um, more important to do so now that we have been experiencing um, COVID and how that is impacted. So what I wanna do first is I'm gonna show a video um, because I just feel like sometimes words are not enough. And so I'll show this and then uh, I'll come back and we will talk. So just one second here. I want to give them that moment of happiness, at least for them to forget about sort of this whole crisis that's happening. Vera Zniewski has played for her grandmother since she was a child. It's always been about bringing her joy, now more than ever. She kind of understands a little bit what's going on. Obviously, she understands the safety that is involved with this. But, you know, at the same time, I hear her crying on the phone that she misses us. And, you know, for them to try to explain to them what quarantine means, even social distancing, they're sort of aware of what it is, but they don't really uh, understand because they've never experienced something like this before. This is an extraordinary act of love. And while the precautions behind it are necessary, they're heartbreaking too isolating the most vulnerable. This has been sure hell, really. I don't know if The thought that her husband is looking for her and can't find her. From a distance and from a device, Martha Farnell tells us it's tearing her apart. He must be looking for me because he always did. He was always looking to see if I'm coming, if I'm going to be there. So I wonder, often wonder what must go into, through his mind when he doesn't see me, he can't see me, he can't hear me. Before COVID-19, Martha spent hours by her husband Willard's side. He has advanced dementia and lives in a long-term care home. His agitation eases when she's nearby. But the last time she saw him, she had to tell him she didn't know when she would be back. It just broke me up. And we really hugged and he was crying and I was crying. He seemed to understand. I kept telling him they, they don't want me to come in here anymore. So we cried. Then when I, I went home, it was so hard to go home. That was the last time I saw him. Go up here a bit, Karen. Powerless in a pandemic. Okay. Mike Walker can't visit his wife Karen anymore either. Well, Karen, how are you doing today? The facility she's in offers him an iPad to connect with his wife. It's a new way of communicating for now. Better than nothing. It's as close as he can get, and he's yeah. afraid for how long. There you go. Come on, smile. We're getting there. My wife is uh, has dementia, so it's hard because you don't know how long it's going to be to the point where she, when I walk in, and she just looks at me and has a blank face, or knows me, or don't know me, and. Every day ticking along is another day that it's going to get worse. It's not a backward disease. And that's probably the hard part about it, knowing that every day is getting worse and worse and worse. The ban on visitors in homes and hospitals is meant to protect the elderly from a disease that could kill them. Yet everyone at Baycrest is acutely aware of the toll loneliness can take. Does it concern you? Of course it concerns me and it concerns everybody. We're always very mindful of our clients' mental health, and this is not great. 
Dr. Adriana Schnall says it's why employees here helped organize this birthday party for a resident. One family went outside of the window and the residents stood inside and they were all there and they had balloons and they celebrated. I call it a la COVID, you know, like <laughs> these are the times now. And it was so meaningful for everybody around. And yet others can't wave from the window or don't have a smartphone. 85-year-old Stephen Parker was hospitalized with pneumonia a couple of weeks ago. His daughter, Marianne Parker, calls him every day. Hi. But no one knows when this will be over, especially her father. I'm very well. We're all keeping safe. And uh, He said, you know, the, the hardest times are when you have all that time to yourself. You know, the 3 a.m. wake-ups where you lie there and Im imagine what's happening. And I think all of us would go down that route of imagining the worst and am I going to see anyone again or is this it? Is this what I'm facing? And it's just, it, it's such a lonely place to be. Okay, Dad. Okay. Bye. The need to be with the ones you love, it's even stronger now. Vera's grandmother can't see well, and while music is a powerful bridge, Vera just wishes she could get even closer. Are you okay, Bobta? Okay? Okay, okay, okay. I have mixed feelings. It, it makes me kind of feel angry, to be honest. I'm not angry because they're taking precautions. I'm just angry when it comes to time, only because you know our, our time together is limited and I can't physically be with her. You know, my grandmother is 94 years old, and um, I feel like time has been taken away from us, especially at a time when she's so fragile. And so it's, it's trying to keep a brave face during a time when there's crisis and trying to do what I can to bring her happiness at least. Even if she can only deliver that happiness from a distance. <laughs> Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. So I start with that video because I really feel like it is hard to put to words what people are going through and what people are feeling um, during COVID. And as you can see in the video, it's not just about the elder adult. Of course, it's about the older adult, um, but it's also about the family members, family members who are know that their loved one is alone and may not understand why they're not coming to visit. Um, so we are seeing a lot of complicated grief right now um, and we know that that is going to continue uh, for families um, and for the older adults themselves. Um, in nursing homes there's the struggle of keeping residents in their room. Um, now that has been uh, in many places now the residents don't have to stay in their rooms anymore but for months on end they did and that was really hard. Um, so it wasn't even, a, they didn't, you know, I think most people imagine that they were out and about in the facility, but that wasn't so. So um, I kind of want to now, um, I've kind of given the, the feeling of what that's like, and now I'd like to go into some information. Just so, you know, I always feel like it's important to give some statistics to get some sense of the impact. So, uh, in terms of numbers, all of this will make sense in a moment as I talk through. Um, men are more likely to be married, 65 plus. So all of this is 65 plus, and, unless I specify otherwise. Um, so they're more likely to be married compared to women. Um, and on top of that, there is three times as many widows, that is women who have lost their husband, than widowers, uh, men who have lost their wives. 
uh, we also know that um, the rate of remarriage for um, uh, older adult males um, is in the 90 percentile. 27% uh, non-institutionalized elders live alone and about 9.7 million women um, of that and 5 million men. Um, the other thing is that in terms of institutionalization, we in the, in the U.S., the belief is that we do place our older adults in nursing homes, and the reality is, is that's not true. Only about 4 to 5 percent of older adults are in nursing homes at any one point in time. So what you're going to find is the vast majority of people are living in the community, and that can um, definitely make them vulnerable to loneliness and isolation. And you can see that 42 percent of women 75 and older live alone. So we know that um, from conception um, through uh, late adulthood, end of life, uh, men or males uh, die at higher rates than women. So you really do have so many more women um, at, in, the, in the latter stages of life. A group that kind of has taken um, the aging field by surprise is the elder orphans. So they also oftentimes the term solo agers is used as well. Um, the reason this is taking us by surprise is that um, this is kind of a new um, uh, phenomenon. In the 60s when we had um, feminism was at its height, uh, 60s and 70s, um, the talk then was what women fought for, one of the things they fought for, was the right to not have children. Um, it was very stigmatizing at that time for a woman to say, I don't want to be a mother, I don't want to have children, I want to focus on my career. Um, and so that was a big um, an issue that feminists addressed. And so it took a while, but it became more acceptable for women to say, I don't want to have children. But, you know, we never know how we don't think about ramifications of um, changes in society and one of the ramifications then has been the elder orphan and that is women that didn't have children um, and maybe they didn't partner or maybe they did partner but their partner has passed um, and this can be true for males too but what we it's it's um, higher number in terms of females is they have no living children more likely to live alone, not married or partnered, and so you have like 22 percent of older adults, again mostly women, who are considered elder orphans. And um, so who is going to provide the care for them, but even more importantly, um, where are they going to get their social connectedness, um, those social contacts? And so there, elder orphans then are, are at a higher risk of actually experiencing um, social isolation and loneliness. So I want to talk about the difference between social isolation and loneliness because they're not the same thing. Um, first of all, there is the social, the idea of social connectedness. Um, we have talked about this um, in the field of aging um, for years and because we in our research have found that it is so crucial that um, people have these feelings of connectedness, um, having a social network. And what we learned, I remember um, early on in social work, um, it wasn't, we never talked about the quality of relationships. It was very much more about does the person that you're working with, if they're living at home, do they have anyone? They have somebody, great, then we check that off. But now we know it's not just that you have somebody. It has to do with the relationship. You know, is it a, is it a quality relationship or is it conflictual? What you, in terms of that social connectedness, that feeling, you would need for it to be one that is quality. It has meaningful contact. In the contact, we think of physical. It could be physical, but the contact can just be the contact of sharing intellectual intimacy, emotional intimacy, etc. Um, and so, and, and the connection, having that at that interpersonal level is so important. So we know social connectedness um, is uh, significant. So social isolation. That is when there is this absence 
um, of social interactions and relationships. And it could be that your network, maybe you have a social network, but it is very small. Um, some people have no social network. Um, and so then they become isolated. And with older adults, your parents, a lot of times they're gone. Uh, of course, your grandparents, etc. cetera. Um, you may have children, but maybe they don't live close to you. You know, when I was growing up, we weren't a global um, aging society. We weren't globally aging. Um, we weren't connected in ways such that um, it really, people didn't move, people didn't travel in, so families were more likely to live together or at least in the same, you know, city or town. But that is very different now. Um, and so it is more, oftentimes more likely that uh, adult children have to move for jobs, etc., and they're not close by. So you can become socially isolated. So signs of it? It's just being, <clears throat> excuse me, being bored. Just kind of a general lack of interest kind of in life itself. It could be that the person is withdrawing more um, and not going out as much. And going out can be just like to the grocery store and different things. It could be that now they order online. Um, so they really do um, become more isolated. Um, oftentimes we can tell uh, when we social workers go out and do assessments there may be that the person's hygiene is is not good they're not eating well um, there's not a lot of food in the house and if there is it's not nutritious it's you know it's more of like frozen meals um, and oftentimes another sign is just kind of the disrepair and clutter um, and even hoarding in a home um, and that's because of just the lack of there's boredom, lack of interest, no one's coming over, um, and so the home can just fall into disrepair. And also, oftentimes, it is our connections that help us with repairs and, you know, going to the grocery store and, and the things that we kind of take for granted when we're younger versus older. So that's social isolation. But loneliness is different, and that's because it's a more of a subjective feeling. It's how people see their own experiences and very much how they feel about the social isolation. So uh, you've probably heard people talk about, you know, I can be in a room of people and feel lonely. Um, and then you've probably heard people say, I can be at home all by myself and not feel lonely. So individuals can truly be socially, socially isolated and not feel lonely. Um, and there's quite a bit of research on this at this time. And there are different types of loneliness, so it's not just this general overall feeling. Some people may feel the loneliness in terms of, you know, not having an intimate relationship. Um, or it could be social loneliness where they just kind of feel they lack that contact with other people. Um, collective loneliness, that is that, you know, maybe you have a broader community, but you don't feel valued by your broader community. Um, <clears throat> I know that um, I had a, an older adult that I was working with and her community was really her church um, and to her it was so important to be able to go and that was key and, it, and when she was going she didn't feel lonely when she had those connections um, with people at church but then there came a point where she couldn't drive anymore um, and the church didn't have a van and people didn't offer to come pick her up and she just kind of felt like she wasn't valued, and that was really hard. She lost her community. Um, and then there's existential loneliness, um, which can also be very powerful. And that is just feeling like there's just no purpose or meaning to life. Um, you're just alone, and um, what's the point, as, as many of the older adults I've worked with have said. So those are the different types of loneliness. And when I train students, I always talk about the importance of understanding those types because how we work with an older adult who is feeling loneliness, um, it's going to make a difference whether it is the emotional piece, it's the collective piece, um, as to the intervention, you know, how we work with the older adult. So. Besides the fact that there is a difference between social isolation and loneliness, and then there are these um, different types of loneliness, 
um, and the fact that you can be social, socially isolated and not feel lonely, or you can be not so socially isolated and feel lonely. Um, Newell and Mimic came up with four main groups that they talk about. Um, first of all, they talk about the vulnerable group and um, the group that um, uh, we should really be concerned about. And those are people that are not only socially, socially isolated, but also feel lonely. Then their group is like the lone farmers, lifelong isolates. Um, so they're socially isolated, but they're not lonely. The reason they use the term lone farmers is because farmers oftentimes are, are really used to, with their big farms, etc., used to being isolated, being out in a rural area where maybe, you know, they're, um, uh, there's not, uh, they get very used to that, being by themselves. Um, and then lonely in a crowd. So you're lonely, but you're not isolated. And then the majority group which is the not soci socially isolated and not lonely. Um, when they did this um, article, it was pre-pandemic. Um, and so that majority group, um, and uh, I think many of those people have moved to the vulnerable group. And I'm talking about older adults today, but um, I, the social isolation and loneliness um, and the combinations thereof also are impacting young people um, uh, adult, you know, uh, children, adolescents, uh, young adults, adults, um, COVID has really, um, had an impact, uh, on individuals across the lifespan. So I just want to note that. So what are risks, um, for socially isolated and lonely elders? Um, what we know, and the research is very consistent on this, is that when there is this lack of support systems and resources, so there's not the resources um, available, we, that uh, older adults do experience higher rates of depression, anxiety, poor health, mortality, cognitive decline. Um, off the, over the years, um, I have often talked about the fact that you know, for a long time, people believed that an older adult would become senile, that it was a part of aging. They used the word senile, um, and it meant that you were experiencing cognitive decline and that that was a normal part of aging. We don't use that term anymore because cognitive decline is not a normal part of aging. Um, you know, if you have a disease um, or if you are social, socially isolated or your nutrition is poor, etc., those um, type of events can uh, result in cognitive decline. So cognitive decline is not just a given. We also know that mortality rates um, are higher. And so part of it has to do with, because this is having such an impact, not only on mental health, but that mental health then is influencing how they're taking care of themselves physically with regard to nutrition, et cetera. So the risks are great. Um, Facilities, so even though we only have about 4% in facilities at any one time, um, I will say that um, that's nursing home facilities um, and as well as um, uh, any type of long care facility. Um, but the research has focused a great deal mostly on nursing home facilities. So 60% of nursing home residents do not have visitors. Um, either because family has um, passed away, uh, or family has both passed away and moved away, um, or they truly just don't, they're elder orphans. And so I know when I worked in nursing homes, um, both worked there or volunteered there, um, I always made a point of finding out who had no visitors, and then I would make the special effort to visit them first and spend time and get to know them. Um, those that, um, it's more likely that those with visitors, um, it's more likely than those with visitors to be depressed. So we see the depression higher for people who are not having visitors. We also know that they, again, the mortality rate is, is going to be higher than those that do have contact with the outside world. Um, and oftentimes in a facility, it can be lonely and less contact because 
people that have visitors, the research shows is that staff interact with those individuals more than people who do not have visitors. And that's because family members are going to be coming in and they are going to be checking with the resident. Um, the resident, I mean, the family member is going to be talking to the uh, CNAs, the nurses, etc. about did my mother get this, did my mother get that. Um, and so there is more uh, interaction with staff and the residents. So this puts them at a risk. And then also thinking about um, the diverse reasons for why um, uh, other reasons for loneliness. One is substance use issues. Um, and we're seeing this increase um, with the baby boomers because the baby boomers were the drug generation um, and uh, for it's the it was the first generation um, to use drugs and the amount that we used and in the free way that we used them. Um, and so oftentimes what you see is as an older adult ages, you can have an older adult um, that has late onset um, substance use, that is they begin using it after they turn 65 um, and they're using it maybe to cope with, could be health issues, could be loneliness, many different issues. Um, and there are those then that age in, that have been using um, uh, substances for most of their life. But the point is, is that oftentimes they, it will isolate them further, uh, is maybe they can't drive or they're trying to hide it from family members. Chronic or terminal illness, um, chronic illness and terminal illness can keep you from getting out and about. But it also, particularly with terminal illness, can people can be very uncomfortable. Um, and often what the research shows is that friends and people drop away. Um, and so you can become uh, not only more isolated, but feel that loneliness. Um, LGBT elders, we know with the baby boomers um, that uh, many of um, LGBT elders are, as they put it, going back in the closet. So these, this baby boomer generation, these were elders who were, that were not out when they were young. Uh, the term gay meant you were happy. Uh, people didn't talk about it. And so they spent most of their life, again, as they say, in the closet. And then Stonewall riots came in the 60s um, and there was more movement and attention. And so many of uh, people that LGBT elders, their elders now, did come out at that time. But what they're finding is, is that they are having to go back in the closet because the reception in terms of um, the healthcare system has not been good, nor the long-term care system. Um, elders of color, oftentimes um, isolated, they can be isolated in facilities, um, uh, in terms of facilities being um, oftentimes uh, the dominant non-Hispanic white, uh, they can be isolated in terms of where they're living. Um, so uh, that can definitely, and we have to remember that the disparities are great um, for uh, older adults of color. Mental health issues can be isolating. Um, people living with dementia, uh, people who are unable to hear and or see. Um, hearing, you know, you. People think, well, just go get a hearing aid. Well, not everybody can afford a hearing aid. They're, they run about 5000 and that's not even for the best. Um, Medicare doesn't cover at this time either hearing aids or uh, vision. So um, it, it can be very hard for all, all older adults to be able to address these issues. Um, elder caregivers. So we have elders who are caring for elders. It could be that maybe you're 70 and you're caring for your you know, 90-year-old mother. Um, and so for elder caregivers, that also can be um, isolating. Um, but with all of this, there's the isolation, but it is coupled um, with loneliness and then incontinence. Um, you would love to go out, you'd love to be with friends, etc., but you're so scared that you are going to experience incontinence when you are um, out and about. And um, and a lot of times elders don't necessarily know about wearing Depends and people always talk about, you know, wearing um, uh, types of underwear like Depends, there's different brands, um, that, that that's childlike. And so there's been a lot of negativity and stigma attached to that. So oftentimes they'll just stay home. Cultural changes, 
this isn't just in the U.S. that we're seeing this, and this was even prior um, to COVID. Um, we, there's cultural shifts in many countries um, as countries, um, uh, people often use the term as they industrialize, as they become more westernized. And so, but the economy drives this quite a bit. Um, Japan is an example where the economy is such that even though the tradition, the cultural tradition has always been that um, children will care for the older adults and usually it is the daughter or daughter-in-law. Um, but nowadays because of e changes in uh, the economics, uh, both people have to work. Both, you know, the the child and her spouse have to work. Um, and so there's not always that ability to um, care for an older adult. So older adults now are starting to see that that tradition is falling away. Um, the other thing too is that their children may live in different countries, so they're not even living in Japan. And I'm picking Japan just because I have some uh, specific sites I can give you, but there are other sites about other countries, even England, um, Ireland, Scotland, uh, Australia, we are seeing these shifts. So you can see in this slide that in 2040, um, projected 44% of households will only have one elder. So very much at risk of uh, social, social isolation and or loneliness. The one example that they give in Japan of these weekend traditional family bonds um, and obligations is the literally hundreds of thousands of unclaimed urns, the urns that have the ashes of a loved one. Um, they're just piling up. And uh, when they do contact relatives, they either many don't respond or they refuse to come and collect the remains. And then the other, um, in 2017, it was the research discovered, and this has continued, that 50% of Tokyo elders who shoplifted, lived alone, and 40% had no family. And what um, the more recent research is showing that uh, mostly these are women, and they will purposefully shoplift. And the reason is, is because then um, they will, um, I'm using the term incarcerated, but it's not necessarily prison per se. Um, they will be placed in a facility and they will be held there until their sentence is up. So they've got company, and usually they're put in with other older adults. Uh, we also try to do that here in the U.S. So they're with older adults, um, they're getting meals, um, and for them, that is a wonderful thing. So they will be released, and then they will shoplift again, and then they will go back um, into the facility. So it is more intentional. So we are seeing these changes where we have to be careful about stereotypes to say, oh, but you know what, um, in other countries, this is how it is, uh, because it is shifting across the world as we experience this global aging. Other potential risks are major transitions. Um, and major transitions can be, for example, even retirement. Uh, we don't, we prepare people financially, but we don't prepare them. Um, for retirement in terms of the psychosocial. So um, when I was living in Arkansas, I used to do workshops for large companies and the work, and it was for retirement. But I would meet with people who were around 55. So they weren't at retirement age yet, but they were beginning to think about it. And what I would work with them is not the financial, I would work with them around the psychosocial. So beginning to prepare themselves, beginning to think about, you know, what will retirement look like? Because the reality is, even if you're tired of working, it can be very scary to wake up one day and have nowhere to go. So how can you prepare so that you don't have such a rough transition? Um, and uh, that societal role, if your career has been really important to you, you know, it can be very hard to, ha to lose that role. Um, deaths of loved ones. As you get older, people around you die. Friends die, etc. And those are difficult transitions. Um, the loss of a friend that you have always been able to turn to. Um, loss of mobility and therefore many times transportation. It depends upon where you live. 
Um, transportation disparities are great in our nation. Uh, again, we don't do anything, um, any training to prepare people for that transition. Um, there are a few um, uh, programs in the U.S., transportation programs. What they're trying to do is when an older adult is not going to be able to drive anymore, um, what they'll do is they will teach them how to use the bus, um, you know, uh, and or train or a subway or whatever the transportation is. And people will kind of roll their eyes and go, uh, didn't they know? Not necessarily, because maybe they always drove and they never used the other transportation. And so it's very scary. Um, and they can't afford an Uber or a taxi. So these are things where we need to really um, uh, think about. And also, urb, I mean, rural, rural areas, it is very, um, can be um, very much isolating and can lead to loneliness. So how do we know? What assessments? Um, so there we can detect social isolation um, and um, loneliness and, and it can be treated. Um, but there are obstacles to this. First of all, um, there can be uh, comorbidity with other health and social conditions. So it often can kind of be um, hidden maybe um, in terms of if you are feeling lonely and you are depressed, it could be that the depression has partly that the belief is that the depression is due to the health uh, reasons um, or the health can lead you to be because your health is poor and maybe it's harder to get out and about. So it can be hard sometimes to figure out um, what is, um, is it the loneliness, social isolation or health? And there's a lot of uh, social stigma. Um, it is really hard to be an older adult um, in the, I'm just gonna talk about the US. Um, ageism is prolific in our country. Um, and so there definitely can be stigmatization around um, anyone admitting that, you know, that they are, they, they've been socially isolated because you know, like the church example I gave, no one is thinking about we need to come up with things for people that can't get to church or neighbors maybe being involved in driving someone to church. Um, and so sometimes you just don't want to admit those things. Um, and also there is not a standard screening. And that is um, definitely an issue. So this is an AARP chart. It's from 2018. Um, so this is pre-COVID. Um, I'm sure that they are collecting more data now. Um, so in terms of this, you can see that 15% um, of adults 40 or older have been asked about social isolation or loneliness during a medical exam. Adults 70 or older, only 20% 20, 20 are asked, rather. And we can see that Hispanic Latino adults, 27%. So they're more likely um, to report that they've been asked. Here you can see where you asked, the question was, where you ask about social isolation or loneliness during an exam. So the dark blue um, is the total of everyone, 40 plus. Um, and so you can see the 15% of the saying that yes, they had been asked. 16% um, is 40 through 49. 15%, um, that's the 50 through 59. Um, and then it drops to 10% with 60 to 69. and goes up um, at, 70, uh, at 70 plus age to 20%. So the vast majority of um, older adults are not being screened, particularly so here, um, looking beyond the 40 to 49 or even the 50 to 59, getting to where we really need to be concerned about um, the isolation and or loneliness. And the reason I say that is, is because we don't, know in terms of health issues. There could be many things that are going on um, in that group. So it's measurable. I'm not going to go into to detail. Um, and you can easily find these um, screening assessment instruments so uh, online. 
So the social network index is one that is often used by social workers. It asks about social connections um, and it asks, asks about the types of relationship um, and frequency, but probably the thing that they really focus on so much is the perceived closeness. So they want to know, it could be that you say, I have lots of different relationships. I have friends, I see people, but that closeness, um, if it's not the closeness that uh, you perceive is important to you can be problematic. Loneliness is also measurable, a scale that has been used, um, very reliable, um, uh, reliability, validity um, has been um, checked multiple times and that's the UCLA loneliness scale. And here it kind of gets into um, how often you feel that lack of companionship, you feel left out, you feel isolated from others. So you can see the difference between the assessments. One's asking about this social network index, about your connections and relationships and types of relationships and, contact, and contacts. But with the loneliness scale, they're asking about feelings. And remember when I talked earlier about that, um, uh, that, isolate, that loneliness is more about those feelings. So there are definitely benefits. Um, and to um, not being uh, in that group where you are soci socially isolated and lonely. People that feel more fulfilled in those areas, we know they live longer and they're also healthier. And there's lots of research on this. Um, they have a more positive attitude in life, fewer negative feelings, and um, oftentimes they are more physically active and the connections they have with acquaintances and can result in even more benefits. So very beneficial. So I've talked about, I've defined, I've given you the risk, I've talked about screening. So then as my students would say, well, what the heck do we do? So here's a few things um, and these certainly aren't all and some of these um, have changed some due to COVID. But first of all, there's the digital connection. So um, computer classes, uh, when, and uh, some of these classes have started back up again during COVID certainly, um, uh, they, uh, elders, they weren't holding these as much. Um, but it's about teaching older adults. So it is true that we have Gen Z now, that is our new generation, and uh, they were born with technology. So Baby boomers, who uh, make up the vast majority of older adults now, um, did not grow up with technology. I know that um, I didn't even get a computer, and I got one of the first computers you could buy, and that was, I think I was like 28. Um, so we really came late to this. Um, and But computer classes, back home in Arkansas, I taught computer classes for older adults and older adults can learn and um, they're nervous, there's no doubt about it, but they definitely can learn and learning about computers, getting comfortable with them, then provides them with a, a way to have online engagement if, there are, if they are so, socially isolated. Um, Facebook, we know that boomers make up a large portion of those individuals on Facebook. Facebook is becoming not as popular with uh, younger adults, but we definitely see it with older adults. Um, and you can see that in terms of, and the statistics, I wish I could get newer ones, but this is where we're at at this time, is 2016, that 70% of older adults um, uh, who use Facebook log in daily. Um, and we, there's also research that reports that there is that social connectedness. So they can connect with others. Um, and sometimes uh, it has, it, it can also um, increase their own kind of subjective well-being, um, lessen their depression, lessen their anxiety. One of the things that Facebook is used a lot for is uh, adults that are um, elders that are providing care for elders. Or um, example, one of the growing um, populations in the U.S. is uh, grandparents taking care of grandchildren, and that's mostly due to the opioid, um, uh, well, I just, 
Uh, I just lost my word. That's not good. <laughs> but anyway, the opioid growing. Um, and so uh, parents of children um, being incarcerated or uh, not able to provide for their children. So they also use Facebook a lot in sharing tips with each other um, about raising grandchildren or about caring for other people. AARP um, is, is, has a website called Social Connectedness. It's really a great website. They've been doing a lot of research on how to connect. And one of the areas they've been looking at is in, in housing complexes. So this could be assisted living where you have your own apartment, um, but you also have available to you assistance in terms of uh, a nurse or a certified nursing assistant that can bathe or whatever. Um, and it also can be um, uh, other types of complexes, retirement centers, etc. Um, and the goal is to reduce isolation and loneliness. Um, and what they found is that increasing interactions through voice activated technology um, has really uh, been very successful. So they have purchased uh, a lot of the um, let me see if I have this on the next page, just a second. Let me just go one more page over. Yes, I did. Okay, I'll do it here. So they purchase Alexa. Um, Y'all you know an Echo Show. Echo Show is another type of device that um, you can get on Amazon. The difference between Alexa and Echo Show is that with Alexa, um, uh, you can't visibly see people. Echo Show, you can connect with other people and visibly see. So they're really trying to have those devices in the room um, that people can talk to and the device talks back or connects you with other people. Um, it connects you to the radio. Um, and if you're not able to uh, use technology as well or your bed band, etc., you can do this through your voice. You know, Alexa play the song. Um, so Skype Skype is kind of now that Zoom has become more prolific, um, we're seeing more of Zoom use. There are self-journaling sites that oftentimes are um, uh, used by older adults and that in their curetogether.com so that you actually, um, you're self-journaling but you are sharing with others. There's all sorts of cognitive games and those are good also for your cognitive um, ability to keep it from uh, any types of declining if because if you're not using it you want to use it or lose it. Um, there are different types of social networking like my boomer place. Um, you can actually do volunteer work um, and donations, um, uh, charitable donations. They have sites where you can go um, and do that. So people, um, older adults through the pandemic, we've seen them uh, doing Bridge Buddy programs, that's on here, um, where they either will do them online or they'll call another older adult via phone. Um, and so that that is excellent. I know my students in my current aging class are doing the Bridge Buddy program. So they're contacting older adults and a lot via the phone, some online, um, and visiting with them an hour a week. And um, you know, it really, we know, makes a difference. We have research. University without walls, that is, being able to take classes online. Um, there, there's like Curiosity Stream, that's a great site. Um, there's all different types of support groups. Um, uh, support groups for widows, um, just all types of support groups. Um, Twitter for the news, there's health support chat rooms. So, lots in terms of the digital connection, but the digital connection is not an option for everybody. And um, just as we see uh, when we talk about healthcare disparities, we know that there are technology um, disparities, um, access to it. First of all, the cost, not a lot of people can afford to pay for the internet um, uh, or any of the devices that um, they can use to connect with other people. So that just if technology is the way that, you know, if you're social, socially isolated 
and lonely, technology may be the only way that you could connect, but you can't afford to. We have seen during COVID that not everyone has um, access to internet. Um, broadband is not available everywhere. And in addition to that, um, not everybody can afford uh, to pay for it. Uh, people being digitally unprepared, and I kind of talked about that um, with the need for more education. Um, and people do oftentimes do need help. And I will say that this, it, another thing that can be very isolation isolating is a language. Um, it, so if someone is helping you, um, and English is not your first language, so you're going to need someone that um, can show you sites, take you to the sites that are going to be in your language. Uh, if you have any physical, so that's why, you know, if, if I have arthritis, it's really painful. It may not be using a keyboard or holding a mouse, that kind of pinch um, function that may not be feasible. So something like what they're trying out in terms of AARP with Alexa is good where you're using your voice. Um, advertisement, spam, you know, there's a lot of, lot of scams out there um, for, uh, that are directed at older adults who don't have the savvy of uh, younger people who have spent most of their life with technology um, and not knowing credibility as to which sites to avoid. And I even see this with my students when I assign um, papers, et cetera, and I say that, you know, you can use websites. I always have them, uh, the students have me approve the website. And the reason I do that is not to be controlling, but rather it's another way for them to learn, like if they're in healthcare, for example, for them to learn which healthcare websites are not good and do not give accurate information and which ones are really good. So it's just part of the learning. So other things offline, um, we need to address incontinence issues. We need to talk about this more um, and think about the fact that not everybody can afford to pins. So um, how do we um, increase people's uh, ability to do so? How do, you know, let's talk about incontinence issues. Um, I remember even having that talk with my mom and since my brothers didn't have it with her, but as being her daughter, us both being women, you know, she was comfortable talking to me about it. And I was able to talk to her about some of the things that she could do. Um, hearing and vision test, uh, encouraging, trying to find for people to do them. Um, and if it's about affordability or about transportation, making that available as much as possible. Um, and also trying to find places that will, some places will do um, free hearing test. They might not give the, the, and sometimes they'll give discounts in terms of getting the hearing aid. Same thing with vision. Um, and also fighting at the policy level for Medicare to do that because when you can't hear and you can't see, you're at risk for falls and uh, other things that can lead to much more cost, a uh, high cost than just covering the cost of uh, test and eyeglasses and hearing aids. Ensure support for older adults who are grieving a loss. Um, I think that uh, social workers are gonna be, uh, and are already, uh, we're seeing the mental health um, arena really being overwhelmed with such a need, so many people that are grieving losses uh, and different types of losses due to COVID, not just the loss of a person. Ensure support for caregivers right now. It's, it's, I've been doing this for so long and we still do not have the support for caregivers that is needed. And the number of caregivers, you know, it's only increasing. Address the transportation issues like I talked about um, and assist elders with building connections um, with the neighbors, church, etc. Well, one of the things that my son and I always did um, while he was growing up um, we often rented and so when we would move into a neighborhood and rent a house or apartment or whatever, we paid close attention to whether there were any um, older adults who were living alone and we would reach out with cookies or whatever and talk and then at the older adult we could tell they were very isolated um, and, and sometimes we had older adults that were isolated and they were very happy about that and did not want to see us again and that was okay. We left cookies and left, 
and others that were very happy to see us. And I know my son sometimes would go over and just, you know, visit, and I would as well. Um, so neighbors, um, neighborhoods can become communities. Um, and I know one community I lived in, everybody participated in the community of taking care of an older adult who was living alone and diagnosed with um, bipolar. And um, she would have trouble with her meds, and that was hard on her family, didn't live there, but uh, one of us would helped her with her meds, one of us took her to church on Sundays, you know, one of us bought groceries, so we kind of split up the chores in the neighborhood. So some other strategies, senior centers are great. Boomers don't like the word, sen the term senior centers, and so we're seeing more states like California moving to changing the name. Um, they don't like the word senior, and they don't like the word elderly. Pets, both living and robotic. Sometimes robotic is safer if you have someone that has dementia and that's further along. Um, who might, you know, throw the pet. It's robotics, a robotic pet is good. Companion programs where another senior comes out and um, visits with you. So it's somebody that's more your age, etc. And we have uh, RSVP is a great organization, organization to contact. Coming up with group activities, um, doing, the, you know, the social contributions um, through the volunteer sites. Um, and like in doing more like the bridge buddies, etc. And the most important I think is the sense of purpose is huge. But let me say it's not huge for everyone. Um, it depends upon the culture as to what sense of purpose and how it's defined. Um, and so I know I'm running out of time so I can't go into that today. Um, offline strategies encouraging older adults to volunteer. Um, the reality is oftentimes, I remember when my mom, we needed someone to kind of um, stay with her while my brother was at work, and um, my mother said, I don't want a young person. She said, I want somebody that I don't have to explain everything to, and it's going to know if I bring up a TV show or a certain thing that happened when I was young that they'll understand. Um, so uh, older adults, working with older adults is great on both parts, right? Um, let's see, yeah, so we know that volunteering, this is, volunteering has been heavily studied, and so what you're seeing here is the benefits many, many studies have shown um, this to be. So it is a great thing, and older adults can volunteer with older adults. And these are just some newer strategies that people are coming up with. Um, they're more specific and not available to everybody, um, but they, there is hope that they'll spread across the nation. Uh, PAPA is, allows elders to hire college-age students to help with errands, driving, um, places, tech support and companionship, and you just go online and you sign up um, for uh, uh, college-age students in your area. Tea with strangers, um, and that can be done um, virtually as well, so you can check that website out. Um, solutions for healthy aging. This is where, um, this is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, they're doing a lot of programs there, uh, intergenerational. And what we know is that intergenerational uh, programs benefit not only older adults, but they also uh, uh, benefit younger people um, because younger people don't have a lot of contact with older adults. And so then, they have these stereotypes of what an older adult looks like or what an older adult will be like. Um, in my aging class where I have students volunteer um, 25 hours uh, throughout the semester with older adults, one of the things they always talk about the most for every class is they're so surprised that an older adult is so much just like them. Um, and they feel silly, but I tell them it's because there's not always that contact except with maybe your grandparents. And that's different. Uh, and I just talked about intergenerational, so I just wanted to bring up a couple um, that you can visit. Um, and this one, the age to age, is rural communities. Um, and they look at projects. It's really interesting, so you can visit that. They look at projects that um, older adults and younger people can accomplish together. Um, and the other thing is that younger people can learn skills from the older adults, and that gives the older adults the sense of purpose. Um, other generational programs, um, Generations United, 
big brothers, big sisters of Rock Walworth and Jefferson Counties, uh, Milwaukee, the Dance Works Intergenerational Multi-Arts Programs. Um, I have seen the different multi-arts programs. They are really great too. So these are all good. And then the, whoops, the last thing is in England, they have the Happy to Chat bench. And on the benches, they will have the sign and it says, sit here if you don't mind someone stopping to say hello. And that way they know if an older adult is just sitting, um, they know whether they're gonna, whether they want to talk or not. So I really like this um, at, because sometimes, I know just to end with kind of a, a funny story, here's my contact information. Um, I know I was sitting, before COVID, I was sitting out just enjoying, you know, the weather and I was sitting on a wall just here on campus and I had a number of uh, young students come up to me and bend over and say, are you all right? Um, do you need any help? And so, I, you know, it was nice that they felt that way, but it's also that sense of a difference when an older adult is sitting by themselves versus when a younger person is sitting by themselves. So when I um, uh, saw the, you know, stop and chat, I love that. So um, I'm just going to stop and I see that I have a couple of people that have joined me. And so I want to see, does anybody have questions before I end? And it's okay if you don't. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time and expertise, Tracy. I think you shed so much light on um, just missing information, but also um, assumptions that people might have about um, the needs and, and struggles of older adults. So this was really great. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, and Vivian says thank you and honor Marie. Great. Well, everybody, have a wonderful holiday, and thank you so much for being here today. Okay.